Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have to confess that um, until Judith right now chose my paper for me, I didn't know which I was going to read. I chose but, it blindly. Yeah. No, she, she just did uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The truth is, I, I initially wrote uh, a precy of a book of mine that came out recently called uh, Tradition and Apocalypse, and then the invasion of Ukraine occurred, and I went into a state of despair and wrote a, a, a sort of bleak polemic about Christian politics and the impossibility of restoring Christian culture. Then uh, I decided, no, neither of these was, was worth it. So I wrote something else on metaphysics and phenomenology and realized uh, that it was boring. So I circled back around <laughs> to the first two and Judith, helpfully, in that sort of I Ching way that, that we worked out between us, chose the one on politics, which is good because it fulfills one of my, my, my primary goals in life. It's the one that's more likely to annoy John Milbank, <laughs> uh, whom I love and agree with on almost everything, I just, uh, but, but I do try to annoy him. Um, I think what, what I want to talk about is just the importance of trying to cultivate a certain political sensibility, not a, um, not a particular ideology. I have nothing to pro propose in that way. But I, th I think the recovery, or if, if not the recovery, the cultivation of sensibility is, is actually a vital question right now as we face what seems to be the end of one phase of, of the late liberal order uh, in the West. Um, before asking what the future of Christian thought will be, I suppose we have to ask whether Christian thought has much of a future at all rather than merely a very long posterity. Because there will be Christians in name and spirit for years to come, no doubt, uh, unto the end of the age. But whether Christianity will still have the resources to shape and animate a culture depends on how Christians understand the future to which they are called, and in its light, how they understand their own past. When I chose my title for the talk, as I said, I imagined the topics would be doctrine and theology. Um, because of the recent publication of the book I mentioned. And I, I, I'll talk a little bit about that book, but only now because I want to use it as a, a paradigm for a different set of reflections. Uh, again, it all has to do with Russia's, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, those of us in the Eastern Orthodox world have friends there in both countries, uh, in some cases with whom I can't get in touch right now. So. It's certainly the most monstrous and tragic expression just now of the acute political, social, and cultural crisis that's emerged in recent years from the chronic decay of late modernity's classical liberal consensus, but also uh, uh, an end of the ascendancy of ideologies of national, ethnic, cultural, racial, and religious identity. Uh, and it's also inspired by the re-election to some of you of Viktor Orban and the electoral gains of Marine Le Pen, not to mention a certain lingering presence in American politics, not to be named. The sheer ominousness of the present is sort of crowded matters of creed and confession out of my mind. But in tradition and apocalypse, I argued that the evolution of dogmatic and theological tradition has never consisted in the inexorable unfolding of the inevitable, inevitable consequences of antecedents always already virtually contained in the initial deposit of the faith. Rather, the tradition has advanced fitfully, sometimes traumatically, in light of a future revelation that can be glimpsed from the present only as in a glass darkly, adumbrated in the past but never seen with perfect final clarity the horizon of God becoming all in all in a deified and glorified creation brought to pass in the miraculous commerce of divine and human natures in Christ. Each perdurable doctrinal definition has been at once an expression of the anticipation of that ultimate unveiling and also a revision of the past, 
What it has never been is an anxious, jealous, traditionalist preservation and curation of an unchanging institutional, cultural, or confessional heritage. Whatever political motives may have entered into the early conciliar decisions, for instance, it was the vision of that final reality that provided the essential logic informing the developed theologies of Nicaea and Chalcedon. And to arrive at these theologies, it was necessary to shed certain venerable orthodoxies that had served to sustain the faith, in some cases for centuries. This had two effects on the tradition's understanding of its own past. A discreditable historical revisionism that portrayed the new formulae as nothing but what had been believed everywhere, always, and by all, and so the older, now discarded orthodoxies as perverse deviations from an immemorial consensus fidelium, and also a revitalizing clearer and deeper understanding of affirmations and practices that until then had never been so exquisitely integrated with one another or so richly illuminated by the light of that final horizon. By remembering the last end that lay ever ahead, the tradition discovered fundamental patterns in its own past thrown into relief, ready to be freed from a welter of more incomplete expressions of the faith or more inconsonant with one another. This, if nothing else, knowing this, should inspire in us a certain speculative liberty both with regard to the future, trusting somewhat more in the light of that final horizon than in the mere momentum of history, and with regard to even the settled issues of tradition, recognizing that faith in that final revelation face to face is more vital than inflexible fidelity to ages past. But again, my concern now isn't doctrine, but rather the social reality of what had been a pervasive condition of disillusionment, but that has of late mutated into something far graver. The Innumerable spiritual disaffections of late modernity are familiar to us all. I mean, we, we, we all know the rhetoric. Um, the metaphysical nihilism of a culture that does not acknowledge transcendent goodness, truth, or beauty, or give expression to them in its arts, customs, cults, and moral convictions. A vision of nature as bereft of holiness, mystery, magic, and all genial local animisms. Nature reduced to mere resources to be exploited and exhausted by the power of capital, ceaseless, inadjudicable cultural struggles over incompatible visions of the good, the loss of organic affiliations and identities to the leveling gales of a culturally anonymous individualism, a pervasive voluntarism that understands rational liberty not as the perfection of our natures in communion with all other natures, but rather only as the sovereign exercise of spontaneous private will, and so on. We've all heard the story often enough, and it's all true. Voluntarism began as a doctrine regarding God that then inevitably migrated to the human subject. A late medieval picture of God as absolute will by the late 16th century largely usurped the place of the older picture, and this theology through the technology of print entered into general consciousness as no previous theology ever could have done, and so provided Western humanity at once with a new model of freedom, but also with a God whom it would be necessary in the fullness of time to kill. From this God, we learn to think of freedom as perfect spontaneity of will, possession of inalienable sovereign prerogatives, whether of the absolute monarch, the nation state, or the individual. And seen thus, God for us was no longer the transcendent good who sets the creative will free, the created will free, sorry, to realize its nature in its proper end, but only our most intolerable rival. Liberty so conceived cannot exist within a peaceful order of analogical participation, drawing its being from a higher freedom. It can increase only in such measure as any freedom above itself is diminished and so forth. It's all, again, all of it true. Now, however, we're being reminded of the still more terrible possibilities that lie just behind the liberal order, threatening to take its place if it should finally fail. As we've learned in the past, but forget in periods of apparent stability, even the vestigial Christian humanism preserved within the liberal tradition, 
and historically often better expressed by it than by the church in many times and places, a real solicitude for human dignity, for instance, a belief in the spiritual equality of all persons, an abhorrence of unjust coercion, and all the many delicate and endangered moral conventions we shelter under the names of human rights and social democracy, are terrifically fragile things when supported by no metaphysical or spiritual rationale and no cultural grammar richer than the bare relations of power that define the interactions of the individual, the market, and the sovereign state. It seems obvious that we've arrived at a period of extreme cultural crisis. We can identify much of what brought us to this point, but the anger, violence, and cruelty of the political and cultural forces rising up around us today in their sheer exorbitance elude explanation. All at once, a truly authoritarian future has become again a live option, even for the developed nations, and nationalist, racialist, and tribalist factionalism has been reinvigorated from a thousand different springs. Now, perhaps this was inevitable. Um, I think we only imagine that politics chiefly concerns the living. Would that this were so, as the needs of the living are comparatively obvious. But for most of history and in most cultures, the political has been the realm of the dead, of ghosts. And their expectations of us being communicated only obscurely uh, in oracular embassies are far more mysterious, terrifying, and, and unremitting. At least this is the history of much ancient civic cult and polity, the founders of households and cities, our ancestors required sacrifice and tribute, and in time were translated into gods. From them, the legitimacy of any rule was derived, and they, being local gods of the soil of cult and cultivation and culture, were naturally jealous of the lands they haunted. Throughout the civilizations of the ancient world, political enfranchisement was often bound to the rites of the dead one was allowed to perform. In Rome, for instance, from the time of the kings, the fully enfranchised patrician families were those who could legally exhibit the funerary masks of their forebears, for they alone enjoyed a mystic communion with those silent but abiding judges of our actions. Much of civil law was born out of the anxiety inspired by the silent, accusing gazes of those unseen, ever more exalted, ever more ubiquitous presences. As Nietzsche saw, our debt to them is infinite, our guilt before them, therefore, is beyond expiation. And indeed, we have always already failed them, being lesser men than they were. Not necessarily lesser women, but definitely lesser men, according to the myths. Hence, the almost universal myth of continuous decline. The belief in a lost golden age, followed by successive ages molded from ever baser metals. There have been exceptions, of course. I mean, in the Republic, Plato describes a polity conceived upon an eternal model rather than governed by phantoms. But even he prescribed a myth of autochthony to bind citizens to their polis. And by the time of the laws, some of those ghosts have returned. Then, too, the modern world over the past two and a half centuries has discovered ideology and revolutionary politics absorbed more in plans for the future than in appeasements of the dead. But on the whole, these projects have turned out to be neither more concerned with the living than the ancient civic pieties were, nor less subject to disembodied presences. The only difference is that now it's the ghosts of generations yet unborn who command our devotion. With them, the great narrative of decline turned on its axis so that the golden age of lore now lay ahead while remaining as unattainable as ever. And these ghosts have proved even more implacable in their judgments and more insatiable in their demands. Theirs is the accusing gaze not of gods or ancestors, but far more terrifyingly of children. That's actually a funny line, but uh, you're obviously all a, a bit jet lagged. <laughs> not that these spectral regimes are exclusive of one another. The Third Reich was a perfect amalgam of the two. Still, um, the age of ideology seems just now to be at an end, that sort of ideology at least. And the old gods of blood and soil, of tribe, race, and nation have returned. Even a good number of Christians 
today seem now eager to embrace them, to serve them. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm speaking out of the American context where everything is always more extreme and somewhat stupider than everywhere else. Uh, that's simply our national genius. <laughs> Except in jazz and baseball, our two great co contributions to human experience. The political extremism currently most en vogue on the religious far right in America and elsewhere is the new Catholic integralism, for instance, a movement dedicated to the seemingly benign proposition that political order should be oriented toward the common good, both material and spiritual. But for the actual integralists, this means that the state and the Roman church must form an integral unity with the latter as the source of all political authority as well as moral and spiritual, and the former as a powerful deputed executive. And the best system for achieving this apparently would be national governance by an absolute, absolute hereditary monarchy. See how the terms always remain modern. Enfolded within a global governance by a papal empire, I'm not making this up. The civic life incubated within this hierarchy of powers would be a confessional and patriarchal state in which citizenship would be limited to Catholics and full political enfranchisement to males with some concessions to widows and other irregular female heads of households. In short, it's basically a neo-phalangist fascism for inadequate personalities, intent on defeating decadence through autocracy. Predictably, it professes a special solicitude for the working class, revered cultural institutions, and the nuclear family, as all fascisms do. But there's no extremity of coercion, capital punishment not accepted, that integralists see as illegitimate for the suppression of heresy, blasphemy, sexual immorality, and other deviations from the sacral social order. The most prominent American champion of the cause at present is uh, Adrian Vermeule, a Harvard law professor who in 2016 converted to Catholicism of that strange reactionary American traditionalist variety that's been scrupulously purged of every trace of Christianity and who had no sooner reached the Tiber's other side than he began advocating a so-called common good constitutionalism whose proximate aim is the promotion of a benignly despotic executive power and whose confessed ultimate aim is a theocracy whose rulers, these are his words, would be invested with the power to impose a Christian moral order upon their in time grateful subjects. But the best guide to the movement in its full ghastliness is a recent prissily bombastic manifesto called Integralism, a manual of political philosophy by Thomas Crayon and Alan Fimister, a buoyantly fascistic text advocating throne and altar government, capital punishment, and alienable property rights. That's how you know there's an American involved. Somehow neoliberalism gets worked in with early modern autocracies. The denial of citizenship to non-Catholics, the prohibition of non-monotheistic creeds of, uh, on pain of death, and of all non-Catholic proselytization or ordination, the political disenfranchisement of women as well as of cohabiting couples and their children, the legal subordination of women to men, the execution of blasphemers, heretics, and perhaps members of certain sexual minorities, and even, just for the hell of it, the legitimacy of slavery. God bless America. But one of them's English, come to think of it, Fimister. So, yeah, God bless the Anglosphere. It's tempting just to shrug Crayon and Fimister off, of course. There's something deeply tedious in the authoritarian imagination, especially when it's inflected by so many obviously crypto-erotic pathologies. I mean, the element of sadomasochism in these fever dreams allied as it is to a depressingly predictable misogyny is all too bleakly recognizable. But as absurd as they are, we ignore the, the new integralists at our peril. Persons in sympathy with their movement occupy positions of genuine power in the world, and many others of their kind are waiting in the wings. They are, moreover, emblematic of certain temptations by which despairing believers can all too easily be beguiled, the worst being of mistaking, obviously mistaking Christianity for a cultural or ethnic identity. That's not to say 
there's no such thing as a Christian culture. I'm talking specifically about an isolable identity, a rather ghastly perversion of a form of life that from its earliest days involved eschewing any such affiliation in favor of universal identity vested nowhere but in Christ, in whom there's neither Jew nor Greek. But there are more pardonable temptations, and one of those is to imagine that the cultural and social pathologies of the present are results solely of the loss of an organic unity and vitality that once existed in the Christian West. And so to seek their solution in a restoration of the civil and political accommodations of Christendom. But this can be an insidiously debilitating temptation. Uh, the sickness unto death is not despair, but, but nostalgia. After all, Western modernity came from somewhere. Our forebears would not have taken leave of that vanished order had it not had bred disaffections of its own. This isn't to say that the modern project isn't to some degree uh, an extrinsic import into a culture uh, that might have been innocent of some of its perils, but we shouldn't be naive. We like to think that before the appearance of the modern self-enclosed subject, human beings suffered a little discontent with the corporate identity, hierarchical relations, and sacred verities with which, within which they lived out their lives. And it seems so inviting now when purged of any element of the sordid or mundane, the brutal or the despotic in its pastoral placidities and architectural grandeurs and artistic radiancies, at least when the shrill idiocy of late modern culture is at its most oppressive. But how could the modern subject have come into being and come to occupy the center of our culture if not for some deeply natural longing for dignity, power, and recognition that the social and religious orders of the past did not fully satisfy? Radicals and reactionaries, progressives and conservatives, the neurotically hopeful and the morbidly desperate alike all too often refuse to consider the possibility that as yet there's never been and may never be a political or social order in which human nature can rest satisfied. Though we should keep trying. And we can't reverse history. Reconstructionist and restorationist fantasies are futile. The disappearance of that transcendent horizon of meaning and hope with, within whose embrace Western culture once subsisted is pretty much a fait accompli. Nothing demonstrates this better, perhaps, than the frantic extremism of the fundamentalisms and religious nationalisms and crypto-fascist integralisms of our current moment. I, know I can erase the crypto from that. Um, it's not that, not what was genuinely living and organic and joyous about life lived according to the Christian calendar that these movements now seek to recover. Rather, in good modern fashion, they just want to wield extrinsic power over society and force it into the shape they desire in a way that could never bring about a rebirth of living faith and love in the souls of the governed. The only God now conceivable to them is either a supreme instance of the will to power or a supreme sedative for a desperate psychological need. These reactionary convulsions are not signs of faith in the process of being painfully revived. They're the grotesque contractions of a deepening rigor mortis, a moment when even the putative champions of Christian faith can no longer imagine what would make it appealing in the first place. So I think we should be willing to acknowledge that great historical and cultural transitions are usually also concrete processes of internal critique. I mean, you know, the French Revolution wasn't just an accident. It wasn't just a careless mistake. There is a rationality in history's verdicts and also a spiritual destiny. It's not absolute, but it's hard to, to resist without considerable tact. A social order's collapse from within is the exhaustion of the synthesis that that society embodied and also a loss of innocence that can't simply be reversed. A culture that in the early days of the Christian faith occasionally slipped back into paganism could become Christian again. The history of Gaul is a good example of this. A culture that very late in the Christian era has become disenchanted with the faith of centuries can never again embrace it, at least not in the forms of the past. <laughs> 
Secularity was not adventitiously imposed upon the Christian world. It is simply the old Christendom in its, ex in its all but inexorable terminal phase. And until we make a real effort to rethink the whole history of Christendom from beginning to end and try to understand why it destroyed itself, with some assistance perhaps, we can't sensibly speak about the Christian future. And that story begins somewhat earlier in history than we always care to acknowledge. For one thing, we, we deceive ourselves if we imagine that the theology of voluntarism was only a late medieval aberration rather than a dimension latent in Western Christendom from the time of the late Augustine's theology of predestination onward and latent in Christendom as a whole as a result of the triumph of certain theological and dogmatic tendencies. But even that is only part of the tale. There was also, for example, a paradox of form that haunted Christendom from the start that was never adequately overcome. Given the apocalyptic nature of the faith in its earliest years, the sheer radicalism of its offenses against religious and political order, its expectation of an imminent end of history, it certainly could not have anticipated that it would have to enter history again and become everything it thought it had rejected, an institution, a law, a religion, a civic cult. And this tension erupted with fair regularity over the Christian centuries in chiliasms and revolts and schisms, secularization arguably the final of those schisms. But there were contradictions deeper than the merely formal. The most obvious was the moral dissonance between the gospel and the power of the sword as it was actually wielded by emperors and kings and their servants in the earth, a dissonance that by itself assured that Christendom would in all likelihood destroy its own religious and cultural foundations, deeply sunk though they were in the soil of, of the West. Now it's true, the language and principles of the gospel did illuminate and at times guide Christian society and ameliorate so very much and did become the common spiritual heritage of its peoples. The state did often shelter, preserve, and advance a faith. But the alliance was still a suicide pact. The language of the gospel formed Western conscience even as the institutions of Christendom belied that language. And so rebellion against that hypocrisy even when it took the form of laicism, was saturated by Christian impulses. The most devastating solvent of Christendom was the ineradicable presence of Christianity within it. While the force most destructive of Christianity as a credible source of social order was the crushing burden of Christendom upon it. Then, too, there were contradictions or tensions woven into the very fabric of orthodoxy. For instance, the stress within the gospel between, on the one hand, an often inflexibly legalistic moralism, and on the other, an almost antinomian hunger for a pure justice or grace that neither prudence nor propriety could subdue. One sees this even in Paul's epistles. But with Christendom's collapse, that stress has intensified into an antithesis. When we today see in the ever more acrimonious disputes between conservatives and progressives is not merely some recent struggle between, say, a, a legalistic voluntarism and a libertarian voluntarism, but rather the result of a dialectic intrinsic to Christian history, disentangled from one another in the prism of uh, secular, secularization. That's a, that's a mixed metaphor, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Diffracted from one another in the prism of secularization. Reduced to little more than residual parodies of themselves, the two tendencies naturally gravitate in opposite directions, one towards authoritarianism, the other towards libertinism. The restlessness and ferment, and ferment of our inadjudicable disputes over the form of the good in social life is to a great degree the result of Christendom's disintegration, the loss of the various practical means, sacramental, convivial, penitential, calendrical, ethical that it once provided for holding these opposed forces together in something like harmony. And then, of course, there's the most glaring contradiction of all, the, the doctrine of eternal torment, but I won't talk about that now. Just mention that it would seem to make a nonsense out of all of Christianity's other claims about God, and it, while it took some time, people began to notice. 
But that's all as may be. What's important to emphasize here is that something of a nihilistic destiny was written into the terms of the compact, not in principle, but in fact. I want to make clear that I, I, I have no brief against the idea of, of an integral culture, law, and, and, and Christian love. But in the compacts, Christendom actually struck between Christianity and political power. Resistance to this destiny, moreover, has always proved futile to the degree that it's involved in an attempt to restore that compact. This can never be. One can't conjure faith back into being on the far side of a true and epochal cultural disenchantment. For all the countless moral, social, cultural, and spiritual riches nurtured within the unstable union of gospel and empire, Christendom, not in principle, but simply in fact, once again, was in the end a gloriously fruitful but finally irreparable catastrophe, one whose inevitable terminus was probably always secularism. And secularism's terminus was always, in the fullness of time, a fully self-conscious metaphysical nihilism. If then we're to recover any riches from either the ruins of Christendom or from the accelerating disintegration of the classical liberal order and bring them into a new integrity, we have to learn not simply to imagine the future in the terms of the past, but to remember the future, the kingdom proclaimed from the beginning of the faith and in its light discover the past anew. Again, does Christian thought really have a future or only a posterity, a sort of retirement plan? If the former, it can only be the future proclaimed from the first. And here, when we look forward from Christendom's aftermath and toward the world we should desire, we should also see how the light of that promised kingdom cast back, uh, cast back over Christian history illuminates what is most disorienting in Christ's teachings. The kerygma of Jesus and the apostolic church was a politics, as much as it was anything, but an altogether anomalous politics in the ancient world in that it was so wholly concerned with life. Life lived very much entirely in the present. It was also set beyond the city, outside the gate, outside the lives. Now, I want to make clear, when I talk about the haunting of local places, I said earlier, I'm not talking about nymphs and gods and, and the spirits of living springs. I'm not talking about the living spirits of nature or fairies, or God, all of whom I believe in, by the way. I'm talking about the manes, the, 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 uh, the, the departed, who are the source of law and order in the present, because of their ancient absence. From the perspective of the traditional ghostly politics, this gospel was a council of dereliction and wastefulness, a creed for civil recreants, taking no thought for the morrow, imparting to all who ask, remitting all debts, receiving and giving freely, sharing all in common, an impious politics too, and situating its loyalty neither in the city nor in the household, neither in the nation nor in the family, but only in Christ, a politics of life and that in all abundance lived already on the far side of death, of feasts and fellowship and rejoicing. It was above all the politics of one who refused to remain dead, to become a phantom, to assume the obscure and threatening eminence of the revered ancestors, consecrating a local soil with his monuments and moldering bones but who instead breathed out his spirit upon his followers, constituting them as a living body in history. Again, I'm not offering any prescriptions for a future Christian ideology. As I say, I'm simply trying to isolate a sensibility because I think that's where we have to begin. I'm not trying to identify what a Christian politics of the future must be, but I, I think I can point to what it cannot be which, be, which, among other things, would be a nostalgia for an old compromise, much less for its most authoritarian expressions. Surely it must entail an absolute renunciation of any confusion between Christian identity and identity of any other kind, ethnic, national, obviously, but even, even cultural. Christianity does create culture, yes, but no culture is Christianity. It must always be transcendent of the cultures it forms. 
Between this politics of life and the politics of the dead, there, there has to be a total severance, which I'm thinking now of the integralist again. I'm thinking of this ominous rightward, uh, or even if that's the right direction, I'm not sure, uh, backward, downward movement of, of the Christian right, especially in America, but uh, as we see throughout the, the, the lands of erstwhile Christendom. This isn't to say that there couldn't be a new, radically different, more Christian kind of Christendom, the air quotes. What Christian thought really still does have to offer to the future is, that, is, is, is a spiritual cosmopolitanism that it has always had in itself, purged of the pathos of identity, answerable not to ancestral ghosts in their intransigently local haunts, but only to the festive unity of boundless differences assured by Easter that even the dead are not really dead, but part of the community of the living. The truly great achievements of the Christian past can't be recovered or renewed unless they're entirely dissociated from the lacerating contradictions of the Christendom that was, unless we just want to recapitulate a tragic history, as well as from its more morbid orthodoxies. What are we doing all the time? That sounds right. Okay. <laughs> the legacy of the ancient union of church and nation, not because it failed, but be because for so long it succeeded, is a Christianity corrupted, fragmented, internally incoherent. As a result, the liberal order that is dying around us so rapidly is impervious to the appeal of Christianity, except perhaps in the perverted form of a cult of tribe or native heath. And just now, the sickly appeals of traditionalism and of the integralism of the right are the greatest obstacles to the pursuit of a genuinely Christian social and political vision. There are many other obstacles, but this is the most pernicious because for many the most tempting. I mean, if you hate decadence, you're drawn to autocracy sometimes just by, na just by natural reaction. Really, we have no time left for that nonsense. It's not only the liberal order that's dying around us, but the world itself as a consequence. We need to set, a, set aside these hopeless fantasies of reintegration from above and seek instead the recovery not of a social contradiction that terminated naturally in a metaphysical nihilism, but an ethos of eternal life in the present, a sort of new romanticism, for want of a better word, that loves life, the life of the natural world and of human community more than property or power or capital, or an unrelenting love of all the beautiful fragilities and delicate personal bonds that our epoch is systematically eradicating. I suspect it would require throwing off the burden of certain ancient supersessionisms with regard not only to Judaism, but to much of paganism as well. I'm just throwing that in now and not explaining myself. Here, too, we should erase the boundary between the living and the dead, if we can. I do believe we are at a moment when we have to discern the difference between a truly vital future for Christian thought and mere persistence, between, that is, resurrection and haunting. Here, too, however, one has to avoid being naive. It's natural to assume that the impossibility, indeed, in the case of, say, of integralism, the sheer evil of attempting a reintegration of culture and faith from above must mean that the true work of integration will involve reconstructing the genuinely organic subsidiarities and local spiritual ecologies that the modern world has done so much to destroy, and that's true. We, we, but we also have to be aware that these local affinities, associations, and shared practices have been rendered for most modern persons no less incredible and unappealing than the enormous structures of sacralized state power. Here, too, a simple return to the past is impossible except as a kind of cultural theater, if it's done badly. What has taken leave as faith can return only as irony. I've noted in the past that part of the story of the rise of metaphysical nihilism in the culture of the West was the great success of Christianity in claiming for itself so much of what was bountiful, splendid, and still vital in the pagan world, it succeeded. So that as the Christian vision of reality became incredible to the mind of the West, so did all the enchanted and enchanting visions of the more distant past. 
So now by the workings of the same law, apparently, the passing of the liberal order seems very likely to carry away with it even the vestigial tendernesses and reverences it had inherited from the Christian past. I have no idea what that Christianity would look like or even whether it's possible to imagine it, this renewed sensibility I'm talking about. But really, we can't truly really know, know fully what we should do, what we should seek to preserve from the past, what we should entirely abandon, what truths we must recover, what falsehoods we must repudiate, what we should be newly open to, until we learn to look again to the future promised in the first dawn of the gospel, rather than into the dark backward and abysm of time, to the spirit, that is, of our ancestors, or of our nations, or even of the Christendom that was and that will never be again. For now, uh, what call that sensibility, and again, I'm simply talking about a sensibility isolated from and contrary to the other temptations of the time. What we can call it for now imprecisely, but hopefully is the politics of resurrection. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.